We're doing it live. You ever seen that? Bill O'Reilly? I've I seen that. We're actually. doing it live. Yeah. How's everyone doing? Hope you are doing well. My name is Andrew Kuhn, Focus Compounding, sitting next to Jeff Gannon. Jeff, how's it going today? Uh, it's going very well, Andrew. How's it going? It's going great. We hope it's going great for everybody else as well. Hey, if you're watching us on YouTube, hit that subscribe button. Thumbs this video up. We are trying to hack that YouTube algorithm. Leave us a comment down below. Uh, people ask, like, do you check the comments? I do check the comments. I try to respond to all of them. And a lot of times when we uh, someone leaves a question, uh, we will use it as a filter for future podcasts, future content. Uh, so keep uh, leaving comments. Definitely love to see it. If you're listening on the podcast side of things, a rating review goes a very long way. And then if you want to get access to the website that Jeff and I use to pull financial data on companies, go to quickfs.net. Um, we have found it to be the best and quite honestly, it's the quickest, which hence the name QuickFS. There's no ads. Uh, there's not a lot of fluff. Pretty much gets you everything that you need. And then I really love the Excel um, download on the companies. You'll pre-populate a model for you. So if you do sign up for that, uh, make sure you tell them that you came from Focus Compounding and we get a piece of that subscription price. So in today's podcast, we're going to be talking about how the hell do you go or how the hell do you read a 10K? Okay. I was going to say, how the hell do you go through a 10K? But how the hell do you read a 10K? This is the most common question that we get asked. Uh, this is specifically I would say from so. an email that I got. Yeah. But not only that. I mean, so when we posted you know, this uh, poll for future podcast topics, mm -hmm. a lot of people were asking about this as well. Yes. And Jeff and I, we were just talking about this. I was like, I feel like a lot of people, they make it a bigger deal than it is. It's, okay. it's a document. You, you read it. And I think once you've read 10, you know, what's nice about 10Ks is mm -hmm. they're all formatted the same way. And that's what I like about it. Um, so I think once you've read 10 or 20, then you could really start to really, um, you know, just sort of know where to navigate uh, within the 10K, but we do it a little bit differently than other people. You do it differently than other people, but I do it differently than you do. Okay. So how the hell do you read a 10K? Well, I, so this question was specifically um, had some things that I can understand why it'd be very difficult. So one, like the first 10K that you read or something, in this case, I think the first 10K he was reading was, it may have literally been Facebook or something like that. It's very difficult if you do that. So one, uh, it's much easier if you pick a very, very small company. Much easier. So oh. I would highly recommend that. Mm -hmm. um, I would actually recommend if your employer is publicly traded, pick them. Um, if... Uh, there are places at least that you frequent, um, then at least pick that. So at least do something where you've been to the place. Um, do things locally if you want to, or even things like say uh, that you, you know, um, uh, uh, the best is a place that you've worked before. But if not a place that you've worked before, at least um, something that you uh, have uh Mm, that, that you've been to physically or something. So things like retailers and stuff can be easier for that way because at least you can imagine a lot of the things. Uh, don't pick very, very large companies. Pick very small companies and very simple businesses. So like if you're going to do a bank, make sure that you pick a as your first 10K that you read a bank with one branch. Do not pick JP Morgan. Um, and seriously, I mean that literally pick a bank with one branch. Uh, that's by far the easiest thing to do. And the, there are, you know, I don't know, there, there are several publicly traded banks with one branch. And the reason behind that is maybe a smaller company has one or two revenue lines. It's easier to figure out the businesses mm -hmm. as opposed to looking at like an Apple. I mean, Apple's actually kind of a difficult, you know, right. report. And to your point earlier of um, being able to imagine, I always say the same thing. Mm -hmm. It's good to study a company where you've like been the customer, you understand the business from the customer standpoint. So you could really visualize it when you're reading the 10K. And I think it allows you to actively read it more. When we were talking about graph tech, and I always mm -hmm. love to talk about this, and we were talking about like Coke needles and like, I don't, I don't even know what they're doing. <laughs> My brain just shut off when we were going over it. I had zero interest yeah, in doing needles. it. I, I just needle had absolute, <laughs> yeah, whatever you are. <laughs> Coke needles or something very different. That's, that's why I told you. <laughs> oh, shoot. Yeah, probably. But I was just saying like I had zero I just wasn't interested in it. Right. You know, but like studying a company like Facebook or Microsoft or, um, you know, Apple or whatever. Right. You know, Facebook, I understand Instagram. I like GIFs. I just bought GIF. Mm -hmm. Microsoft, I have a Surface. 
um, you know, I, I could go into a one branch bank and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. It just makes the process easier, I think, for people that are trying to really figure it out. Yeah. And then the the next thing I would say, and I've said this before, but I can't recommend it enough, is um, read 10Ks in the same industry. So if you, I know people don't want to do this, but if your first five 10Ks that you read are one bank, one retailer, one oil company, one drug company, that's not going to help that much. But if you read each of the, um, like like we wrote up in uh, Singular Diligence, the reports are on focus compounding, um, uh, MROs. So companies like Granger and uh, we did uh, MSC Industrial Direct, right? So they have some similarities to them. We did five or six um, uh, regional banks in a row, things like that. So if, if you do one theme park company, do another. And you'll learn a lot more about comparing them and stuff anyway from coming from that. But also just the different ways they describe their business and many of the things that they say over and over that are the same. That'll be a lot more helpful. Um, A lot of this question had to do with, like, do you literally read every word? And that is a complicated answer. So I don't read particularly fast. So if I do the math on how long it takes to read a 10K and how fast I'm reading and how many words could be in the 10K, then it's possible that I'm not reading all the words in the 10K for something like uh, Facebook or something. On the other hand, for something that's a small company, it would make a lot of sense because it doesn't take me much different depending on how big the 10K is. Um, We did something where we looked at Lehman Brothers and stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So... um, one of the hardest podcasts we've ever done, by the way. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so it depends. Some, we company, tried. some companies have their 10K structure where they almost repeat the exact same thing. In fact, most S1s that they do spin off things uh, seem to be structured in a way in which they basically repeat the entire thing over again. Um, there are other ones that aren't that way. So it depends. Uh, I do read all of certain things. So I certainly read all of the footnotes. Um, I read all the business description and then you get into some, I'm trying to think of some things where I wouldn't read something that isn't a repetition of exactly the same thing. So do you read, let's say um, the auditor's report from top to bottom? No. So I don't read the auditor's report from top to bottom because I don't have to by scanning it. I can tell all the parts that will be repeated exactly. And I have check marks in it. So you can see the check marks and the check marks have to do with whether they did or didn't look at internal controls, uh, whether it fairly represents an audit, which is a clean audit opinion. So if there's the terminology that would be used for a clean audit opinion, and then if there's anything mentioned. So like I would notice if they said something about a going concern, um, something that wasn't a clean audit opinion. And then I also note um, where they're from and how long they've been the auditor. Mm-hmm. But it's true that I would not read the entire description of the audit thing because it's boilerplate, except for about a couple lines that have to be there. Like the last couple lines. <laughs> yeah, the last couple yeah. lines, basically. Um, what about the risk section? The risks I do read in complete detail, although there, yeah, and com- I don't think that there's any time where I don't read the risks. I think you could actually learn a lot about a business. No, I mean, no, there's a lot of right. it that is written by lawyers, um, mm-hmm. so the company just doesn't get s- sued. But there's a lot of stuff in there that you could kind of, I think, learn about the business and the potential risks of it um, yeah. from reading the, the risk section. Yeah. Now, there are certain sections of the risk thing which will be repeated almost exactly from one company to the next. Mm -hmm. So like one of them will be things like um, our stock price may be volatile. Uh, We may report poor earnings or something. Uh, There'll also be one that we may impair goodwill, which I don't care about. Um, And almost every company will say that we have a substantial amount that has a lot of goodwill. We have a substantial amount of goodwill. We could write it down. It could affect our stock price, things like that. Um, So there are certain things that are repeated almost word for word that way. Mm -hmm. Uh, from one company to the next. Uh, It's much more common with very big companies, though. It's a lot less common. Uh, Smaller companies are more likely to have idiosyncratic 10Ks and sometimes potentially much more interesting ones. They may disclose things that I don't know if someone's telling them you don't have to disclose that if if they like are writing that themselves, what's going on there. So um, tiny companies are much more likely to just start telling you what who their customer is. It's not customer A, customer B. This is our customer. This is what we do. Um, This is who we think our main competitors are. Yeah. I've seen exhibits on very small companies included. Exhibits are things that are in, if so, if you go to sec.gov slash Edgar and you go and look things up, you'll notice that there's a 10 K, but there's also in there certain exhibits, like there might be a 99.1 or something. And when you have those, sometimes they're interesting. Like NACO includes audited financials for all of its um, unconsolidated subsidiaries, or I should say them all grouped together, which is very interesting uh, economic information stuff to have. And uh, for other companies, it might just be things like investor presentations and things. But I've seen ones that are uh, 
they didn't remove confidential information from them. So, uh, so, you know, very detailed things, whereas very big companies take out stuff that it's, I don't know, like what's so important about it confidential. Like you could probably guess what it is, mm-hmm. but so like I've seen things like purchase agreements that didn't remove the stuff for a very small company that gives details on the terms of the purchase, which is competitive information that someone would like to know that exactly what they're paying for their supply and stuff, but they didn't remove it. Um, so, you know, that happens with very small companies. Sometimes you can find interesting things in there. You know, it was interesting. So Jeff actually came up with this topic and I don't know if you saw, but this weekend I actually tweeted out a video from Buffett from maybe the the eighties okay. of somebody asked him, how do you read a 10 K? Right. And he actually, he gave some pretty good, uh, pretty good explanation. And he was talking about how, you know, they don't really care about like all the pictures and the graphs and everything mm-hmm. like that. But one thing I thought was interesting was he said that they're just, he's like, I'm just trying to get the figures. I'm just trying to get the facts and how he's never bought a stock. And I think he was actually talking about Coca-Cola because of what management has said. It's really been yeah. like the figures, the facts um, that he got out of the reports. Do you find that to be the case with you as well? Yes. So one thing that I feel kind of mixed about is I sometimes recommend to people who kind of don't feel comfortable with the 10 K you can read the investor presentation first and then go back to the 10 K. And in fact, what I've actually suggested to people is try to read the 10 K. Then when it, you feel you don't understand it, go to the investor presentation. And then after doing the investor presentation, go back to the 10 K. Um, I don't, I think management's very important. I think I, on this podcast, give the impression that I don't care that much about management stuff. And this is in the MDNA section. Yeah. Um, but I, I, um, I generally, why a 10K is so useful is because you're getting information much less uh, through the way that management would present it. There's a lot more figures and things in there, like you were saying, uh, and just disclosures in there that isn't how management would present it. And sometimes interesting things, the reverse of what you'd expect. I've read things in the risk section, which actually made me like the company a lot more. Um, they're, they're trying to warn you away, like don't invest in our stock or whatever, but they actually are saying things that are pretty interesting that way. You know, um, uh, investor presentations are tricky and I like using the 10K without investor presentations a lot more. I, whenever possible, I try to read the 10K. I mean, whenever possible, which for me is rare, I like to read the 10K when I don't even know the stock price. Mm-hmm. Um, the spin also have that advantage generally because yeah. of when I research them and stuff, I actually can't know what the breakout price will be. So I like those a lot. Um, but I do, I, I really don't read the investor presentation first. That's something that I strongly don't do. And, um, and unfortunately for a lot of people, I notice that they read the investor presentation and don't read the 10 K. The 10 K is, the 10 K is very, very important. Occasionally there's information that I need outside the 10 K, but you know, with a really good investment idea, sometimes 80% of it can be just from reading the 10 K. You don't need anything else. So you- and I've said this before on the podcast, and every time I kind of say it, I don't know if you necessarily agree okay. with me, All right. but I know other investors because I talk to a lot, I mean, probably more beginner and stuff, like my DMs sure. on Twitter and stuff okay. like that. I think you have like an incredible ability to read a 10K and get the story out of it. Every single stock has a story. I know what you're saying, business. yeah. You know what I'm saying? But you, you just do. And I don't know if that comes from... Um, you know, just from looking at so many different companies or so many different situations or what, but you, you just have an, a good ability where to some people they can look at a 10 K and it's boilerplate. Like, okay, well, mm-hmm. where do I go from here? This is dry. Right. How do I know this is a good investment? How do I know? This is, you know what I'm saying? But you, you have this ability just to like go out of left field and then you pull this, this, this story effectively out of, out of the 10 K. So I don't know. How do you cultivate that? How do you I mean, you know what I'm saying? I, I know what you mean because sometimes I read a 10K and I do get something out of it that other people uh, don't in the sense that I become like worked up about this auditor issue or worked up about the way that management is presenting things or like I, I don't like what they're doing with things that I'm seeing in the 10K. And it's sometimes the di- a different from the way that they would present it or I feel that it has a very strong um, business franchise or whatever that isn't necessarily what they said. Um, I, I do... I talk about actively reading it. So I mark it up heavily. Yeah. And in particular, there's a lot of questions and, and not just questions, but guesses. I do a lot of guessing. Um, so there's a lot of things in which, uh, well, one thing I did is I talked about like, a, um, uh, I forget what you call it exactly, but it's a, a, a Fermi calculation type thing, a guess, however you would do it, an estimate, which is that if you have a bunch of different guesses, the best that you can do, um, and you factor them together, 
your overall guess that you'll have is likely to not be as far off as someone might think. So you've seen, so as an example, I get, I look at, you know, they have certain things about employees and this and that and the other thing. And I start to guess things about, well, how many employees, you know, how many employees would you need per customer and stuff? And so some of these numbers, you can figure out the ratios, mm -hmm. you know? And so I do calculations on that. Like, um, so just as an example, there's certain standard things that you do all the time. You do like R and D as a percent of sales, but R and D as a percent of um, gross profit. I think sometimes is more useful. Things like how much uh, R and D is being spent per employee in it. So I'm trying to figure out stuff like that. Like I, if I do the math and go, you know, I've done it for some companies since forty five thousand dollars per employee that they say is involved in R and D. It doesn't seem like a very big number to me, so I worry a little bit about that. Like, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. They say they're spending a lot on R and D. They're a small company, but how exactly does that work? If I divide your number of employees that you claim are R and D employees in by your amount you spend on R and D, and I'm getting a number that's really low, you know. And so I, sometimes I look at those things and like get to certain guesses about the company. Um, I, I had a somewhat negative. Uh, I guess, write-up of a company or whatever. I, I don't really write negative things about it. But it was a company that was doing a bunch of acquisitions and things. And my feeling was the stuff they were buying was good, but they weren't investing in it and stuff. The company doesn't tell you that. But... Um, but I, but I have to say, after I did read that up, I did find some short posts on Value Investors Club or at One or something that did say some of the same things I was saying. Although from like talking to people in the... Um, industry and stuff mm -hmm. more than when I was trying to get from the 10k Buffett said that too after you've done a lot of like investigating industry or something in the past and you've read a lot of 10ks it becomes less necessary sometimes to be able to get a good you can guess some things for just from reading 10ks without actually talking to anyone in the industry and then when you talk to them they're in agreement with what you just said without you needing a source in the industry to know it mm -hmm. just because you've compared a lot of the 10ks so I wonder if that's the way to word it you're great at adding context to this very I don't somewhat boilerplate, but also somewhat dry piece of document where you're able to actually pull out information from it. So when you're talking about doing like R and D as a percentage of sales, it tells you this or certain things, you know, that's what you're really good at is, you know, you get the story because you add context to it. Yeah, I think that's possible. I also think, um, I don't know, like if you remember the Buffett thing where he wrote down the pages where he had the problems with the Lehman thing. Yeah. Um, when I'm going at a 10K, one thing is I'm not respectful at all of what the 10K is trying to tell me. Mm -hmm. I don't care. It's just a source for me to take things out of. I don't care what management is trying to tell me, what the lawyers are trying to tell me. I'm not listening to their story. Because most people take it as it is. Right. You're not, yeah. you can't. And I've read your marked up ones before you, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> no. So, I, and I don't just mean that you're being skeptical or something. What I mean is I just want to get the information that I'm really interested in it mm -hmm. from. And sometimes that information is very different than what they're trying to tell you about. Like they may, like if you're really interested in a company and want to know um, if it is really profitable for the long term, a wide moat company, what you may really care is like, will a, like a really common example is if they mess up and stuff, will their customer leave them? Nowhere in the 10K will they tell you that, no. but there can be hints of that being true and stuff, you know? So, um, uh, I think that that sort of thing is maybe what I'm hunting for in it. And it, it sometimes is not what they're trying to communicate to you. They're also trying to communicate a lot about the year and stuff, which I don't care about. So I don't care about what these current year's earnings were and stuff like that. And there's a ton of that. The, a, a related thing is I do sometimes read earnings call transcripts and mark them up and stuff. And people have asked about it. Is that helpful? Sometimes I found it very helpful to read them over a long period of time, but they're brutal because most of the questions are things I don't care about that the analysts are asking. But sometimes the pattern of the answers over time is very helpful, but you have to go through years of earnings call transcripts to get a deep understanding of the company. But sometimes it does happen. Mm -hmm. um, you know, going back to earlier in the podcast, you were talking about sticking to a smaller company. And the reason you said that was because they probably have one or two Revenue lines, it's just easier to probably figure it out and understand it. One thing that you do and I do, um, we do, is, you know, in the 10K, they always, most of them, I think every single one pretty much I come across, they'll actually break down the business segments, which is probably, right. in my opinion, one of the most important section of the business, uh, yeah. of the 10K. Mm -hmm. And they'll do like the revenue from that segment, usually do like EBIT and 
you know, net earnings from that. And then they'll also show the amount of CapEx that goes into that business section. Yeah. So you could actually, if you want to think about almost on like a sum of the parts basis, you can think about valuation from that or what could this be possibly be worth? Or do they have one business segment that generates free cash flow and one that doesn't? Or do they have one that doesn't require CapEx for yeah. it to operate and they have one that does? I think that's personally one of the most important sections in the 10K. Yeah. And if anyone's ever heard me complain that Google's 10K isn't that good, Alphabet, um, it's because of, I think, poor disclosures on uh, segment stuff and things like that. Mm -hmm. And some of that is because they can, these companies can argue, oh, we're all in the same one segment or we're all in this different one, yeah. you know. And some of them get very split down to the point where they're almost giving you each region and stuff. And some of them give it by product thing. And some try to kind of group it all together and say we're all basically the same thing. But there are some very small ones that are uh, very helpful that way. And there's a big disclosure of that near the back of the 10K, actually. So they'll discuss maybe some of it up front, but they don't have to. But there'll be the detailed disclosures. You're talking about near the very back it's usually like the last page yeah. of it yeah. but it's just interesting because so maybe if it's not business segment but it could be other things too maybe if they own a park and this one's probably and this one's not or um i was actually reading uh one of my favorite pieces of content out there is Q qsr magazine okay and talks about quick service restaurants and it was about potbelly and how they're closing a hundred stores that were unprofitable pre-covid right and i was thinking i was like a hundred store. At what point are you like? Now it wasn't a hundred in a row, right? I'm sure, but it's like one, two, three. Well, hundreds a lot of stores that have unprofitable. Yeah. <laughs> like at what point do you like roll that back and be like, yeah, maybe we should slow down or change? I don't know. But I thought that was interesting, and they wouldn't probably break. I, don't, I haven't looked at their 10k or like fact check since reading that, so I don't know if they break it down like, oh, this region's probable, this one's not. But I just think it's good to really get ingrained in the business. And I think figures like that, they take the boilerplate out of it and really just helps you to get the story of the business. So they have mm -hmm. this profitable segment or they have this store's profitable or this park is profitable and this one's not, whatever it is. I personally, I just think it's the most important part. Well, like a good example for you with the, the Potbelly thing is, let's say you're reading the 10K and I haven't read Potbelly's 10K, so I don't know. But what you may have disclosed is things like their model of here's the model mm -hmm. of what we're trying to do, or at least an investor presentation. We think we're, you know, four wall EBITDA, 15% margins or whatever. And then you look at the company and you go, but it's 2% mar margins yeah, for the whole company. Yeah. Something's going wrong here. But what a lot of people think is, well, that just means that it's bad or they're lying to me or something. But it usually doesn't mean that. What it means is that you have a huge number of unprofitable locations or something. Mm -hmm. So where I've ma I've sometimes made mistakes investing things because there was an example of one where I, I really didn't um, invest in it despite the fact that I should have known. And a big reason was that while its operating results were only so-so, they were very clear in disclosing that half of their locations were underperforming and unprofitable by their definitions and stuff, which meant that the other half were really good. And if they turned it around, it would be a very successful turnaround. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of thing that they weren't trying to sell you on like, we've made a terrible mistake and are running all these things that aren't making any money. But then when you look at it, you go, oh, there's a really big upside here because actually there's a few locations that are doing exactly what they always planned. And then they opened a bunch that aren't, you mm -hmm. know, and that kind of thing will be somewhere in the 10K really. Yeah. Um, it, usually you'll have information like that just because some things won't match up. Like when we talk about how actively I read these things, there's stuff written. I mean, I write yikes and stuff over some of the things because it, it doesn't make any you know sense to me, uh, you know, what they're saying or, or worrying to me. Um, but it is true that it's written in a very boilerplate way that can be difficult. Like um, there's a was a Chinese fraud. I mean, it's acknowledged to be a fraud and stuff now. And it had an interesting one because it had uh, is this the coffee company. No, 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 no. This is a, 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 um, That'd be a good click. It was called Sino Forest, I think, something like that. Um, so it had a disclosure, just a normal disclosure about receivables. And in the disclosure, if you carefully read what it says, is basically we don't get paid. I mean, receivables happen when we try to collect a payment and they don't pay us. Um, they, there are things, if you carefully break down the language of what they were saying, it was pretty awful what they were saying. And it's not the normal thing that you would see listed there. So um, the notes to the financials are more important than almost anything else in it. And yet it's true that when I look through it, for instance, like an appreciation um, schedule kind of thing, where it's just telling me that uh, there are like, for instance, straight line depreciation over a certain amount of years, it's usually going to be the same. So I'm used to seeing vehicles are depreciated over the X number of years. So if they say five years for a vehicle, I think, okay, that's normal. If they say 40 years for a building, that's normal. Um, if I see unusual items there, 
then that really stands out to me. And there may be disclosures about like how much fully depreciated stuff we have and things mm -hmm. like that. And that can sometimes give me theories. Like on one time I saw that and it kind of piqued my interest. And so I looked up um, tax information on this company, uh, on the the uh, their land records. And I realized that they had clearly built a building and claimed it was an improvement. And by doing that, you can depreciate very quickly. So to this day, I never like investigate that company deeply to understand why they want to vastly underreport their their earnings and their assets both by over depreciating and having less assets. But it's very interesting that they would do that. And it's completely the opposite of what most companies would do. Mm -hmm. So that kind of thing is, is helpful. And it's even things like when you compare that. Sometimes I get uh, sometimes. I've said before that I think like Carnival historically, I don't know about the last couple of years, they have some different management and stuff is much more conservative than um, Royal Caribbean and Norwegian. Not everyone agrees with me on those sorts of things and stuff. And I'm not sure it shows up in all the financial things, but there have been hints in past 10 K's and stuff that I feel um, indicated a higher degree of conservatism from, from Carnival in a lot of different ways of reported stuff mm -hmm. than the other companies. I mean, so you saying the footnotes are, you know, the most important part it's because mm -hmm. it, it gives context to the numbers. And yes. you know, what's funny with about the pop belly and I'll probably butcher it, but um, you know, their, their returns have been like terrible. I mean, mm -hmm. like not good. Right. And what was interesting is, and when I say returns, I'm saying from like a return on equity and a return of asset capital right. um, perspective. And uh, when I was reading the unit economics and I may butcher it, uh, I believe it was like 700,000, you know, to, to build the store. And I think they target can't, can't remember if it was 10% or like 15% gross profit. It, okay. it, it, it was like, it was low. When right. You, you did not counting for like, you know, operating expenses and, you mm -hmm. know, SGNA and everything like that. And I was like, Hmm. But then upon, you know, learning that they have a hundred unprofitable stores, it kind of, for me, like solidified, like, oh, okay, I can understand why this company, the unit economics are poor. And I may have butchered it, but I know it, it was very low. Because they, yeah. they were talking about from a gross perspective, and it just it surprised me. And then you know I, I read that they were um, you know they had a bunch of unprofitable stores. So I just thought that was kind of interesting, and that's some stuff I think you could pick up. You know, just because you say you know you're looking at their um, the gross profit or the operating profit on the whole business, and then it may be poor, and then you could figure out why. You know, sort of add context to that is mm -hmm. because you actually go and study whether it's the business segment or or the unit economics or whatever, and it just uh, I guess ties it all together. Yeah, if you're not gonna read, if you if you feel like you can't read a 10k or whatever it might be, the the thing that you might want to spend a ton of time dissecting in great detail is the business description mm -hmm. and competition and possibly risks or at least the risks that aren't totally generic and you'll quickly learn by looking at a bunch of 10 k's what risks are totally generic if they say there may be a financial crisis and it may affect the availability of credit and stuff which i've seen including companies which had not drawn on their credit lines for 10 years mm -hmm. they've left that information in there um uh or you know now that there's covid you know the, the, that's gonna that, be in, that'll be in there. That, yeah. yeah sure so uh, it, not those things but if you pay attention to the risks of like our customer concentration is high or we rely on one source of supply or whatever but also the things that we don't rely on those so the the business thing and the competition thing are the most important but you have to get very good at parsing out the very specific words that they use and i mention that sometimes like it's very important when a company does not indicate that the industry is highly competitive or does not say that others have much greater financial resources than them and things like that. Uh, it's, it's a lot more. So if they say something like the industry is fairly consolidated and competition is generally on basis other than price or something, that would be very, very interesting and suggest it has very strong competitive position because it will almost always say highly fragmented and highly competitive with low barriers to entry. Yeah, yeah. I thought it, I, I was going to say we compete on price or something right. like that. Be like, uh, you know, it's, it's little words like that. But I think you pick up on that just from you know, reading a bunch of different companies and stuff. Yeah, and, and uh, there have been some where the company basically says, there, I mean, uh, I think at some point Tandy says we're not aware of any company that competes across the, although we have many competitors that have sections of uh, compete with parts of our business, that no competitor is as broad across our entire product line and that many of our customers are competitors and competitors are our customers or something mm -hmm. like that, which is incredibly unusual thing for them to say. Um, but even things like when I talk about ad agencies having high retention rates or something, let's say you didn't know that and you look in the 10K, some ad agency 10Ks will say things like, 
um, that there's no contract. I mean, that not that there's no contract, but that you can terminate on like 15 or 30 days notice or something incredibly short. Uh, and yet retention tends to be very high. Mm -hmm. And if you get something like that, that's very impressive because it's not usually how business things work that it's so easy to terminate them, but then almost no one quits. Mm -hmm. Um, and there'll be information about that somewhere, you know, in the 10 K for a lot of them, but it is very complicated. If you tried to pick up Omnicom's 10 K or any of the big ad agencies, it would just be so confusing about what exactly they even do. You know, they're going to talk about like, you know, entire sections of their things that are corporate communications. Things they're not even going to use the word advertising for half of the 10 K, you know, and you're not even sure exactly what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I think it's, you want to focus on things that you, I mean, it, if you know some businesses really well, the best thing to do is to know that business and then try to read their 10 K based on what you already know. And the easiest one is if you have an employer who's, who's publicly traded, mm -hmm. but if not, then at least do other ones that you know something about them and how they work. Um, because then you can sort of learn how a 10 K works, but because, because you already know what the business is and how that works, mm -hmm. even if it's something that you just use as a customer. And in your, you said earlier about using the 10 K um, in accordance with using an investor presentation. Sometimes mm -hmm. they give out a lot more about the business as well in the investor presentation. They may flat out say, we believe 70% of our revenue is reoccurring. Yeah. It's like, wow, that paints the picture. Thank you very much. Yeah. You know, stuff. You uh, could pick up on stuff like that. I think it's very, very useful. The only thing I would caution for people, I think that for if you're having trouble with the 10K, read the investor presentation first, then the 10K, it will make it a lot easier. But when analyzing a company, I don't read the investor presentation first. And the reason I don't is that I don't want to get, it, it would be possible for management to frame too much of what I'm about to see in the 10K <laughs> and to describe it away, you know, to describe to me why they don't actually need to use much R&D or something before letting me figure that fact out mm -hmm. and, and then, you know, work back from there. So I, I do think that, especially when you're starting out and stuff, yes, you can read the investor presentation first. Look, if you're having trouble with the 10Ks, get the other stuff, the Value Investors Club write up of it or the Corner Berkshire and Fairfax thread or the investor presentation or all of it together and put that, all that stuff, especially investor day presentation that they do, like if they do once a year or something, and then use that stuff before you go into the 10K. The other thing is for the average person listening to this, um, I do read the proxy statement, the 10Q and the 10K. Some people will lose their minds if they have to read both a 10Q and a 10K. There is actually sometimes enough different disclosure between a 10Q and a 10K to interest me, but you're repeating so much of it that it'll drive some people crazy and stuff. And likewise, there's some stuff in the proxy statement that it's kind of not going to be that interesting to people. Um, but I do look at all three of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. And I think the best way to get better, and we've said it since day one, is just commit yourself to, um, you know, reading as many as possible. Right. Yeah. I, I, the other thing is just accept that like it's going to feel like you're not doing it well or whatever, or you don't understand it or something. Mm. And one of the things is it's also okay not to have no conviction about whether you like the company or not at the end of it, whether you even think you can value it, whether you feel you can understand it. That's fine. Um, you know, and I don't expect that everyone listening to this should be able to pick up the 10K of a giant reinsurer and think that they understand something about mm -hmm. it or whatever. But eventually you'll get out of it. And the biggest thing is just like, it's okay to read 10 of them and feel like you don't get anything out of it that you failed in a sense mm -hmm. and not to feel like you did fail and just move on to reading more and more of them because you'll understand them better and, and the, the goal is like um it for the most part honestly it doesn't matter if you misread the 10k as long as you're not going to buy the stock as long as all that happens is you figure out you can't understand it because it's okay to miss most investment opportunities and 95% of the 10Ks you're going to read anyway weren't going to have something in it that was going to make you buy the stock. Mm -hmm. So you can think of it as like just a sunk cost of you learning this thing. That's just what you have yeah, to it's do. It's not a waste of time. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. what you have to do because reading those 10Ks is going to help you understand other companies. Mm -hmm. And that's a really big thing is that um, I would say – the actual time it takes to find a really great investment when you read about it and stuff can be pretty short. But what you don't realize is that you're bringing like all this background to it is usually how it works out. So when I find an investment that I love and I say like it happened really fast, it's because of all this background that I had from reading other 10Ks about things I didn't invest in that kind of like set up the background knowledge that you need. 10Ks become incredibly easy to read if you have a ton of background knowledge that you bring to them. So, you know, if you happen to work in the insurance industry, reading a 10K about an insurer is going to be incredibly easy compared to if you're reading about an oil company. Mm -hmm. But eventually, if you've read 10 in the same industry, like you'll be amazed at how much you bring to it and you've kind of learned. And talk to people too. 
Yeah. Talk to experts in the industry. Talk to, I mean, watch YouTube videos. Watch, I mean, uh, during, you know, we've talked about on the podcast, we own an auto dealer mm -hmm. and our company that owns a bunch of auto dealerships. And on YouTube, he was pretty much the whole shutdown. I think it was like every week he was doing something mm -hmm. on what's going on in the auto industry. I mean, you could just learn so much information. And again, it's just adding context to that, you know, um, you know, that black and white, like dry piece of document. And then you'll be able to take more and more information out of it, you know? Yeah. So I think that's, uh, I think that's good. And then, so transcripts, you said that you always read as well. Uh, yes, I do. And uh, I find them useful, sometimes very useful. It depends. I find them most useful, you know, in, uh, most useful in assessing management, I would say. I mean, NACO, for example, they'll talk about anything. Yes. So that's very useful. That That's not quite a founder type thing, but it is an unusual company. They always give very long, detailed answers. Right. And it's, did, it, did that answer your question? Yeah. I mean, if I say no, and can you clarify, <laughs> I mean, they'll do it, you know, yeah. like very long, very detailed, very, let's, let's talk about it. Yeah. You know? That's, that's sort of not a normal professional management thing. The, the, those are the most useful to listen to and stuff, but yeah, it gives you a good feel for management. And sometimes it gives you a good feel for the company overall and stuff, mm -hmm. but I have found it very useful. And honestly, I mean, this just makes it even more like it sound like more homework and stuff. Uh, reading investor transcripts, uh, uh, earnings calls transcripts between companies in the same industry can be very helpful mm -hmm. and so yes if you read five six seven different banks and you compare what they're saying and stuff like that it, it can be very helpful that way i mean you remember when we i asked a question about return on capital mm -hmm. to nacos management and he pretty much said that's been like a very important measure return on tangible capital employed since as long as he can remember 20 plus years at the company right that's and how they think about business yes and that's very useful for culture and stuff understanding it but for people who've been at the company for a very long time with all this management stuff one of the problems is like you'll read about some companies where they're all fairly new to the company and it's just not as easy but if you do find a company where there's uh, either their founders or their management has been around for a long time or everyone's kind of promoted from the inside and stuff that can be incredibly useful because they just even talk and stuff in ways that are different from other people in, in the industry. Mm -hmm. um, but if it's all the other people being brought in, like, you know, last week they were running Ford and now they're running Honeywell or something, then they're not going to be able to give you a real idea of how this company is so different from every other one. Mm -hmm. But insiders kind of give away by the way they talk about it and stuff, how the company's really been thinking about it forever and how different they are from others. So I got an off topic question. Okay. To that because i just thought about it what are your opinions on celebrity ceos so you have a guy like um i, I don't the uber ceo i can't okay. pronounce it i don't remember uh, uh you, you know his name yeah it's no. something for, okay yeah 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 so he was at um was it travelocity one of those okay and then you know he bounced to um uh, uh to uber or melissa uh mayor yes who i think she, was she at where was she before yeah was it aol I don't know, but you okay. have these these CEOs, these sort of these celebrity CEOs that kind of bounce from company to company, right? Um, or Meg Whitman, right. I think she was actually in talks to go to Uber, so she was going to go okay. from IBM to Uber. Okay. And I mean, what are your opinion? What's your opinion on that? Because you were just talking about you know sort of being promoted from within. And HP. Being, HP. Yeah, you're right. right. Yeah, 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 I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. HP. Yeah. Um, it's a bonus. Uh, you know. Overall, I have to admit I prefer insiders mm -hmm. uh, just because I feel like I can understand it better. Uh, however, people coming in to fix and turn around some things, that is something that some individuals are pretty good at. And if it's sort of like um, – if the attitude to it, so one thing is they could, it, it's kind of like if a football team or something was like, we'll uh, bring in this head coach that everyone wants and stuff. And we'll also make him the general manager and stuff. Like they give him more power than like you would always have. Yeah. So, yeah. so what I'm saying is like, it may be that they kind of give more of a mandate to say, break up the company mm -hmm. and like fire lots of people and <laughs> totally redo certain things. Yeah. Then I understand why you'd be doing it from bringing someone from the outside in that sort of way. Uh, then you have someone with a lot of, uh, buy-in to do that kind of thing, you know? And so I think for turnarounds, it can make sense. There's actually a couple CEOs I can think of, not recent stuff, but overall that actually have been good at being sort of serial turnaround people. Just like there's kind of serial entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. There can be kind of serial turnaround people, but a lot of times the turnaround isn't much of a turnaround needed. It's that large parts of the company aren't very valuable. A few are valuable. Yeah. You just have to cut away the other parts, say, break it up, and anyone could have done fire it. everybody and cut costs and yeah. But you're just hiring a bad guy when you're doing that because everyone 
pretty much should know what needs to be done, but yeah. you just need one person to come in and do it. Yeah, I, that makes sense to me. I mean, Tim Cook, he was in at Apple for some time, and he's done a great job with Apple. Yeah, I, I generally prefer uh, insiders, to be honest, just because I have a better feel for what they're doing. And because if the culture of the company has been successful for a long time in the past, then you kind of want that to be um, maintained. We I, haven't yeah. owned any companies since Focus Compounding Capital Management where we've had a CEO change or anything like that. Have you in your investing career? I'm sure you have, right? Um, yes. Uh, I have... Is it like a business as usual going forward or well, I mean, what's your thoughts? So, on I mean, I've had, <laughs> I've had weird ones. I've had a, some that I've been invested in where, it, so it can be a little complicated. The, the thing about where the CEO and stuff is who, who's the key decision maker or who's really in charge of things and stuff. So I have had ones where the CEO has changed a few times, but a major shareholder slash chairman slash sometimes the CEO <laughs> then retires, then comes back, yeah. hasn't changed. And so it's an interesting question of how much the CEO is really in charge in those sorts of things. Yeah. Um, and I think I mentioned to you before that some, there've been a couple of UK companies where I, uh, two different UK companies where I like didn't invest in them and stuff because they brought in a chairman who was a lot more powerful and they kind of wanted to shake things up. And I kind of like the CEO and the UK is a little different that way than the U S often they have a, um, sometimes they have a stronger chairman and a weaker CEO compared to the U S. So, uh, I didn't do those. Um, yeah, uh, it's, it's an interesting problem when that happens. It's Yeah. I got to say, we don't have a lot of those. And that's even been a problem for things like Buffett and stuff mm -hmm. at some of the companies that he's been investing in. I don't know if you've read a lot of the background, but even things like how he had to get involved in stuff with Coke and things like that. Um, yeah, it can be very tough. I mean, would you look for a CEO that's been in the industry or, I mean, obviously. So uh, to be honest, the 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 managements I've had the most success with had minimal <laughs> and sometimes very minimal knowledge of the industry before they got involved with the business. They were, they just were very good business people and they wanted to run a business and, um, they running a business and building a business from scratch. That's totally different. I mean, there's build the right. sell guys, right? There's yeah. like entrepreneurs. I'm more of a startup, build the sell, pass it on. Then there's, um, sort of the seasoned CEOs that are different, you know, like you see it all the time, especially in the micro cap space. So you could see CEO changes because it's like, okay, we took this company from zero to uh, a billion and now it's time to go from a billion to a gazillion. Let's bring in someone new to do it. You know what I'm saying? Like you yes. sometimes see that. Yeah. The ones I've had tremendous success with, to be honest, are people doing a second career. Um, even we've talked recently about some banks and things. In each case, they're people who had a long term uh, could have been close to retirement age in some cases, basically, and decided, oh, I'm going to take a bunch of my uh, relationships that I have around here and start my own bank. Um, and the same sort of thing in other stuff that I've uh, seen, actually, quite a few times. I mean, even when I mentioned things like Activision, that was not someone who was, I would call much of a video game related person. I mentioned J&J &J Snack Foods. I think he bought that out of bankruptcy wow. to do it. I don't know that he had much... Uh, concerned specifically with um, food stuff as much as here was an opportunity to take a business and run it. Um, so, you know, I mean, you know the story of like uh, Tom Murphy at Cap Capital mm -hmm. Cities and stuff. Basically here, just run this thing and stuff. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I, I don't know. The industry experience thing is a really interesting one. I'm not sure that I've that it's as important. It's most important to me that they have run something before, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the ones that scare me the most is a management thing where it wasn't an operational job. So if you want to know, I mean, this is unfair and stuff, but if you appoint someone, if I'm, if I is invested in a company and stuff, and then I'm hearing that their general counsel or their head of HR yeah. is now going to be in charge, I get very, very worried with that kind of thing. But if it was the head of a major business unit or whatever, then that's, that's a totally different story. What about Todd Combs and Geico? That's a bizarre one. Yeah. I don't we know were talking to, about that the other day. I don't know what to make of that one. I didn't know what to make of it at the time. I feel like it would be a tough job <laughs> like running that and then being an investor and, you know, 
Yeah, it seems to me that it's not like he's just sitting there investing the float all day. I mean, you're the CEO. You're having to deal with right stuff. It it seems to me like well, even when Geico had someone who was in charge of the investments there, and then someone who was in charge of operations, uh, the underwriting part, they were completely separated out. And there's several insurers where that's true, where the the investment part is very important, but the investment person is only a co 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 chairman or something Mm -hmm. usually. Um, You know, they're they're the chief investment officer, but they're not actually just running the whole thing. That one was strange to me, and I don't know if that's like a I assume it's like a temporary thing that's because they had some personnel problem where they couldn't appoint either person. That would be a logical choice. Mm -hmm. So I don't know why that happened exactly. I was surprised that we didn't hear about that at all at the annual meeting. That no one... Well, because I mean, that was such a... That left like a question mark over my head. I was like, wait, what? The only thing I've ever heard him say, uh, Buffett say about it basically is, you know, no, we're not hoping that that's a long-term. Yeah. So I'm sure he's, he's great though. I'm sure Todd Combs would be a good CEO. But I just do think like being an operator and being an investor... It, it is a different skill I don't think set. you can run Geico and do lots of other stuff at the same time. Mm-hmm. But, you know, uh, <laughs> but I think that that, I think Buffett has a few people who are um, uh, a very small number of people who he trusts to take over any sort of problem thing for a brief period or something, you know, something and can just call on them to go wherever they need to be and to mm-hmm. do it. And there's, I don't know, maybe four of them or so. And he's one of them. Yeah. Cool. Well, I thought that was interesting. Well, we went down a few different rabbit holes, but that's what makes podcasting <laughs> the best. Bonus on, uh, I don't know, management and stuff yeah, like that. What that's did we cool. Do there? Yeah. yeah, that was cool. Well, I want to thank everybody so much for tuning in with Jeff and myself. Hit that subscribe button, thumbs this video up. If you want to support us, a rating review goes a very long way. And then if you want to use the website that we use to pull all the financial information, go to quickfs.net. Be sure to sign up. It's $35 a month. Well worth it, in my opinion. Everybody else that has joined has said it's worth it as well. I'm not just selling you on it, even though we do get a, a affiliation, um, I guess, commission every time that you do pay your monthly subscription if you tell them that you came for Focus Compounding. I want to thank everybody so much for tuning in with Jeff and myself, and we will see you in the next podcast.